So this whole video started while I was on cross country in Colorado Springs when my student asked me, sir, how do we navigate the run-up area at a civilian airfield? There's a lot of lines here that do not look like the run-up area back at Vance. So being the hammer instructor pilot that I was, I gave him some homework for the night to figure out how to navigate the run-up area and to back brief me on it before we departed in the morning. Well, the next morning rolls around and he said he couldn't find anything strictly pubs driven as far as guidance on how to enter, exit, and coordinate the use of the run-up area. So I bookmarked that question and knew that I had great content for my next video. After asking around the other instructor pilots in my squadron, nobody actually knew a solid concrete pubs driven answer on how to navigate the run-up area with references to the FAR AIM or the 11202 Vol 3. So this video is my attempt to provide some type of consistency and guidance on how to navigate the run-up area in a civilian airfield. As always, these videos take a ton of personal time and effort to put together. So the best way you can show support for my project is to like, subscribe, and share it with your homies. Now let's get on to the video. So in order to get our answer, I'm going to first break down all of the taxiway markings that you could possibly encounter from the ground up. Once we have established an understanding of all airport markings, we should have a solid foundation through which we can properly understand how to navigate commercial EORs. We'll start by heading over to an airfield that many of my viewers are intimately familiar with, Vance Air Force Base. So the first airport marking we're going to discuss is the taxiway centerline marking a single solid yellow line at the center of a taxiway. At commercial airports, the 150 feet preceding a runway will have an enhanced centerline marking, but you can also find enhanced centerline markings at most towered airfields and military installations. Up next is the taxiway edge markings, which are identified by a double yellow line. Taxiway edge markings come in two types, both continuous and dashed. Continuous markings delineate areas beyond which aircraft operation is not intended, whereas dash markings also identify the operational limit of the taxiway, the pavement beyond a dash marking is still intended for aircraft use. Most runways have paved shoulders that are not intended to be used as load-bearing structures and are typically designed to manage the accumulation of surface water. Most airports will identify these shoulders with perpendicular yellow markings to provide an additional visual aid in high traffic areas. Otherwise, green will be used to help further identify pavement that's not intended for aircraft use. And in some cases, like at LAX, yellow markings with a green backdrop will be used to bring maximum attention to areas not intended for aircraft taxiing. The next type of marking you're likely to see on an airfield is going to be the VOR receiver checkpoint marking. This is a yellow circle with an arrow. The arrow will point directly to the VOR. And if you look off to the side of the taxiway sitting on that checkpoint, you should see a sign that tells you the VOR frequency and the bearing and distance to that VOR. This will allow you to check your own aircraft instruments to ensure that you are getting accurate reception before taking off. Up next are the hold position markings. There are a total of five situations in which you'll be asked to hold position while taxing, and these fall under two categories. The first category is the double solid double dash markings. Under this category, we have the runway hold position marking on a taxiway, which is located at every intersection between a taxiway and a runway and always require clearance to cross. Then we have the runway hold position marking on a runway. These are located on runways which are used for land and hold short operations or when a runway is commonly used as a taxiway and intersects another runway. Clearance to cross is required if using the runway to taxi or if you're directed to do land and hold short operations. And the third situation is going to be the runway approach area hold position markings. These are located anywhere that a taxiway or runway intersects the approach area prior to a runway, close enough to interfere with normal takeoff or landing operations. Clearance to cross is not required 
unless you're specifically directed to hold short of the runway approach area that you're intersecting. Up next is the ILS critical area hold position markings. It's kind of tough to explain how these look, but it's basically a yellow ladder that straddles the taxiway. These markings are designed to prevent aircraft from interfering with ILS frequencies during days with low ceilings. Specifically, when weather is worse than 800 feet and two statue miles of visibility, and an aircraft is inside of the FAF, the ground controller has to make sure that nobody is inside of that area, otherwise we'll have to tell the aircraft on final to go missed approach. So, when applicable, ground should furnish you with instructions directing you to hold short of the ILS critical area. However, if they don't give you those instructions and you're questioning whether or not you need to, it never hurts to ask. The final type of hold position markings are the taxiway hold position markings. So these are gonna be put out anywhere that an aircraft will be asked to hold that is not a runway. So specifically, we're talking places like high traffic taxiway intersections or in holding bays off the side of a taxiway. That's a hint for this video. Specifically, when talking about a holding bay or an EOR, the taxiway hold position markings will ensure adequate clearance from taxing aircraft on the primary taxiway from aircraft that are behind the hold position markings doing their run-ups and pre-flight checks. Up next, we're gonna have the non-movement area boundary marking. So this marking, single solid, single dash line, is going to identify the part of the airport that is under air traffic control and demarcate that from the part of the airport that is basically the Wild West. And that absolutely makes sense when you think about it. Because when you pull into the FBO, the fuel trucks are not making a request with anybody when they pull up to your aircraft. Likewise, you don't need to request with anybody to walk to or from your aircraft in the non-movement area. And that is why it is always my technique that when we enter the non-movement area, we stop all checklist procedures until the aircraft has come to a stop. You can have aircraft taxiing between hangars, people walking around, trucks can move with no notice at all. It is absolutely critical that you keep your head on a swivel in the non-movement area because people are not stating their intentions before they move. Up next is the geographic position markings, which consists of a pink circle outlined by a white ring and a black border with an alphanumeric designator in the middle. Some airports utilize these markings to allow for low visibility taxi operations when RVR is less than 1200 feet. And finally, we have vehicle roadway markings, which are used to define a path for vehicles to travel on paved surfaces that are also used by aircraft. So now that we've covered everything you need to know about taxiing at an airfield, we need to bring together all that knowledge in order to determine how do we navigate a run-up area at a civilian airfield. So after reaching out to the airport managers at Tulsa, Wiley Post, and Wichita, I've ultimately concluded that there is no standardized pubs-driven answer on how to navigate this portion of the airfield. The general consensus is that you use common sense. If the airport is busy, then you need to increase your amount of coordination to get into and out of this structure. If the airport is not busy, then you're fine to just go ahead, pull off, execute your run-ups, execute your checklists, and then continue from there. So from the top, question one, do I have to request to enter the run-up area? The answer is, it depends. While you don't have to request to enter the run-up area, especially if the airfield is busy, you should provide a heads up to the ground controller that you plan to stop in the run-up area when you make your initial request to taxi. This allows them to plan ahead with respect to your intentions. If the airfield is not busy, then it'll be just fine if you pull off into the run-up area when you get there. Question two, where do I park? The answer is always behind the taxiway hold short lines. This enables wider wingspan aircraft to utilize the taxiway and not have to worry about being a conflict with your aircraft. And finally, do I have to request to leave the run-up area? Well, if you coordinated to enter the run-up area, then you absolutely should be coordinating to leave the run-up area. However, again, if it's not busy, 
it won't hurt anybody if you just taxi out of the run-up area, assuming you're not a conflict for any other aircraft on the ground, and just taxi to hold short to make your requests to depart the airfield. The coordination to depart the run-up area should, in my opinion, always be made with ground. There are a million different techniques on this, and I can make a whole video talking about the nuances between when you should talk to ground or tower in this situation. However, I say that you should talk to ground because if you needed to coordinate to get into it, then that means you perceive there to be potential for traffic conflict on the ground. So then that means we should be coordinating to get out of it with the ground controller. The bottom line is that with anything in aviation, communication is key. If there's potential for a conflict on the ground between taxiing aircraft, then you need to coordinate and communicate your intentions. The only concrete universal answer that I got from all the tower controllers I talked to was that you absolutely should be parking behind the taxiway hold short lines in order to allow other aircraft to continue taxiing past you until you're ready to go. And there you have it. That's everything you need to know about the taxiway markings that you could find at an airfield. Final parting shots is that I just wanna say that the most important trait you can have as a pilot is having the humility to admit when you aren't sure what the pubs say about a given situation. Having the humility to acknowledge when you don't know something and going out to research the actual pubs driven answer is always preferable to losing your wings, damaging an aircraft, or getting somebody hurt. Until next time, I'll see you later.